uh, forced into great introspection, existential questions of, you know, who, what, where, when, and why, and how. I didn't have a crutch. I didn't have my car. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a job. I didn't have money. I didn't have my parents. I didn't have friends. And I was lost in trying to trying to find a bit of a compass and an anchor. And some odd things were going on for me in my relationships with some people there where I was questioning my own sanity. And that moment where I was asked to call someone mom and pop, in my chaotic life and <laughs> my anarchic brain that I was living in at the time, that was the first bit of real clarity that I was like, no, that is not open for discussion. All these other odd things that have been happening to me, I've been tallying up to, oh, it must be a cultural difference. It must be a cultural difference. This was something that I went, culture my backside, Ben. I don't care, place, time, whatever. That's not negotiable for me. So I said, no. And it was very clear and it gave me clarity. It gave me some identity and it was just an obvious thing to deny. That really helped with my sanity. Something that was so clear to me that was black and white. I needed that at that time in my life. It's hard to find those things in life in general. Don't trip yourself and face plan because it's going too good. <laughs> Don't get nervous. No, embrace it and stay in stride because the uphill will be there in a minute <laughs> and you'll have to break a sweat and it'll be hard again. It's also about not creating false trauma when it's not needed. And I see a lot of people do that and I've fallen in susceptible to do it as well. The drama's gonna come. Look, we all like pleasure over pain, but I think what we forget sometimes is that there's a greater pleasure that can come with going through a pain. If you go through resistance and you choose resistance at the right times and you go through it, you have greater, more evolved pleasure on the other side of it. This, look at the world a lot of our young people are living in. We're all connected, but nobody's with them. Their world is massive. They have more outreach than any of us ever have, but they're more isolated than ever before. So it's inevitable, human nature, me. I'm betting you, I feel sound with myself. My spirit feels good. I've got three children and a wife. But even I'll have a different reaction if you give me a thumbs up on my comment or a thumbs down. That like, dislike, comment that you put today, that's gonna outlive you. It's immortal, it's permanent. You and I are not permanent. That comment is, think about before you click and what you put out. Are you putting out something today that you're gonna look forward to looking back at? Are you putting out something today in your resume of life that is going to write your eulogy after you're gone, which is gonna introduce you forever wow. when you're gone. Think about it. It can affect you. And so a lot of our youth is living in that world where their emotional feelings about themselves and their own identity is based off your reaction, strangers' reactions. Some of them which may not have even read or cared about what you were actually putting out and didn't care about the intent. And that can affect you. There's a responsibility to that world that millennials live in it. They need to edit and govern back themselves with what they allow themselves to be out there. Proverbial naked they are, just like I'm sharing it all with the world. I'm sending it out to a bunch of strangers and they're gonna come back to me and let me know who I am. Would I be sitting here right now talking to you with the life I have? I'm, I'm very confident that I would have had some sort of enriched life that I felt satisfied and felt joy in living if I'd have been doing something else. But at the same time, those moments, what I can really speak to is that I manned up. I remember things that were mortal in life that I had reverence for. Fame, uh, money, uh, success, people. And all of a sudden, while I still respected them, instead of looking up at all of them, they came down. The reason that I think people believe what I say is that I'm very pessimistic. Most times when you, when you listen to someone who's, who's a motivational speaker, let's say, it fills you with a, a temporary optimism, but you go home and, and, and the wiser part of you knows that mostly it's, it's the painting over of rotten wood with, with a fresh coat of paint. And I tell my audiences very clearly that their life is going to be difficult and sometimes difficult beyond both imagining and tolerance and that that is definitely in your future if it isn't in your present and for many people it's in their present and that that and that 
and that, that can be unbearable, that enough to turn you against life itself, to corrupt, to corrupt you, to, to drive you to nihilism, to drive you to suicide, and worse, to drive you to thoughts of, of vengefulness, of, of infinite scope, to not only be turned against yourself and your fellow men, but to be turned against being itself because of its intrinsically brutal, in some sense, nature. And, and then it's worse than that, actually, because it's not only that we suffer and, and that that will necessarily occur, but that we all make our suffering worse because of our ignorance and our malevolence. And everyone knows that to be true. And so the discussions start, let's say, on, a, on an unshakable foundation. But then I can tell people, look, despite that, despite that, we're remarkable creatures. You know, we're capable of taking up the burden of that suffering and facing the reality of that malevolence voluntarily. We can actually do that. And all of the psychological evidence suggests, and this is independent of your school of psychology, if you're a practical psychologist, a clinical psychologist of any sort, the evidence is crystal clear that if people voluntarily confront the problems that face them and the malevolence that surrounds them, that they can make headway against it. And not only psychologically, so it's not only meaningful to do that psychologically, which, which it is to, to confront the problems that, that torment you voluntarily, that's meaningful psychologically, but it's also practically useful in that you can actually solve some of the problems that beset you. And God only knows how good we could get at that. You know, I mean, I don't know what percentage of human effort is spent in counterproductive activity. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an absolute cynic about that, but I mean, when I talk to undergraduates, I ask them, you know, how much time do you waste every day by your own reckoning? And it's somewhere between five and eight hours. I walked the stu students through an economic analysis of that. I said, well, you know, why don't you value your time at $50 an hour and calculate for yourself just exactly what you're doing to your future by your inability to discipline yourself. It's worth thinking through. In any case, people do waste a lot of time and they, are, they also act counterproductively a lot of the time. Regardless, we do make progress and, 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 and we can thrive under the difficult conditions that make up our lives and we can resist the malevolence that entices us. That's within our power and we don't know the limits to that. And we also know that it's better to we all know this, that it's better to live courageously than cowardly. And you can tell that too, because that's also what you tell people that you love. And we know that you should pick up your damn responsibility and move forward. Everyone knows that. It's, it's part of our intrinsic moral nature.